Well, good morning, Rob, and, uh, and all the Brookses, and probably by extension a whole bunch of other Penn State people I, uh, I miss so much. Um, Tim here out in Oklahoma, and Rob, I thought I'd take you around a little bit on a virtual field trip uh, of my current vast 2.4 acre spread here uh, of ranch land in, uh, in Oklahoma. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I hope you enjoy this and I hope I don't make it uh, horrible. Um, here's Tracy's bench. She likes to come out here and sit and uh, read all sorts of vapid things um, and the dog won't ever leave her alone. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, chinkapin oak. A good, bit of, good amount of chinkapin. Of course, our biggest problem out here is eastern red cedar. Native, just same red cedar, Jupiter, Juniperus virginiana is back east. Um, but uh, intolerant of fire. So in places that have uh, not been burning on at least uh, every three year cycle, uh, eastern red cedar is completely changing the Great Plains and has been for decades now from grassland into shrubland, which is really kind of scary. Um, here's our characteristic dominant tree of the cross timbers, Quercus marylandica, blackjack oak. So I've got some of the native uh, overstory that we would expect out here. Um, we got a lot of locust growing out here too, uh, both black locust and, uh, and honey locust. Um, check out the thorn on that, that mofo, right? That's definitely to keep uh, mastodons from eating this thing. Um, let's see, I'll walk around a little bit. Uh, oh, our state tree, redbud. For us, it blooms in, uh, in March, which is kind of weird. You know, so that's one of those spring comes a lot earlier things here. Uh, we, a lot of, we get a lot of hackberry out here. We get a lot of elm and sumac and walnut and pecan. And those are our characteristic trees of what we call the, uh, the cross timbers. Um, here's one of my... Just wanted to find a good... Uh, yeah, there we go. Good triacanthos on my Gladitia triacanthos here. Three thorns for uh, honey locust. Fish crow just went over. Loa singing down there. He's singing Lonely Heart this morning, which isn't cool. Um, I hope that means they were successful with their first nest and he's starting another one. But it sounds like he might be, it's the first he's been singing for several weeks. So he might have uh, lost a mate. Um, and then so. So that's the spread, and uh, what I'll talk about next is uh, how I'm using so many things I learned from you, Rob, about how to uh, manage the land with the native species in mind and to promote the biodiversity that we, we so much need. And that's all you, buddy. Hey, Nelly, it's pretty cool that we're sitting out here in the burn patch, isn't it? Yeah, this just burned this spring. Look at it now. That's good stuff, isn't it, Nelly? Nelly, you're a star, honey. I might have reached peak fatherhood here. <laughs> you're recording yourself when you said that. Of course. Did you mean to do that? Yeah. Oh, I see. Come on, Jamesy, you're so close. Give him hell, James. Don't let that cedar invade our oak forest. Look out! Run away! <laughs> Timber! <laughs> now I've just cleaned out the uh, nest box where the chickadees have fledged. They've been gone for a couple days now. And it's time to get this material out of the box in case somebody wants to use it again. But it's also a good opportunity to take a look at the construction materials that chickadees will use in their cavity nests. So this is basically a, a rectangle of moss. Some bigger plant fibers down at the bottom, but just all of that is like dried moss. Got some plant fibers in there. Maybe a little bit of hair from my dog. Um, but just incredibly soft warm and in this case dry environment to um, to raise their babies and 
boy, you know, moss isn't that common around here, but these chickadees were certainly able to find some uh, in one little beak full at a time. So very impressive. <laughs> There's a real treat over here this morning. For one blue-gray gnat catcher. Bzz, 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 bzz. But that other one, brrr, that's Northern Parilla Warbler in this big old cottonwood over here. And he sang on cue. What a guy. So one of the things I really love about being out here and going uh, kind of wild management with our, with our lawn management, of course, this was completely, perfectly manicured uh, Bermuda grass monoculture when we moved here in 2015. Um, so we changed that right quick and uh, there hasn't been, there's been very little water even in the depths of our worst droughts. I never really watered. Um, <clears throat> and of course there's not a drop of anything with the, uh, with the word aside at the, as a suffix that's ever been applied here since 2015. Um, so uh, doing so helped me discover a whole bunch of native grasses and native forbs that are actually here we're in the seed bank and have, uh, have come back and it's of course a process there's still lots of other you know non-native stuff i'd like to get rid of uh, but this is one of my favorite little patches so i've got this spectacular blackjack oak tree here it's it's venerable and it's uh, craggy and all that good stuff um, and so this was Clearly one of the trees that was here when this was pasture, you know, probably is you know, I, I don't know when they sold this place. They first did this development in about 2005 uh, And this was probably still working pasture into the 90s, I guess, but this magnificent tree is like, Probably my favorite thing of the whole place and it's only half the tree like at some point uh, Another half of it broke off and is you know has been down there now for quite some time. So um, spread out with the full crown these really are impressive trees much wider than they are tall and this is where I normally hang my bird feeders and uh, here's my bird feeder on the ground because uh, every evening if I don't remember to take my bird feeders down the raccoons come and knock them down and uh, so some things uh, you know are sort of universal but beneath this tree is one of my favorite native grass patches this stuff is buffalo grass and this tiny little grass and you can see it's already going to seed um, that's how tall it gets. So when people say the short grass prairie, this is the dominant grass of the short grass prairie and it gets, you know, that tall. <laughs> and we're not in short grass prairie, of course. We're still, you know, I'm about, I'm actually east of I-35. So, uh, you know, a little bit east even of Dallas. Um, so I've got to go maybe another two or three hundred miles to the west and you get into our very western panhandle like the second half of our panhandle and that's where you really get into the short grass prairie. Um, but then this is that dominant grass. So this is like, this is what fueled bison <laughs> for, you know, untold millennia. This little dinky grass. And uh, it's extraordinary and I love it. And uh, some people um, especially if they have sh smaller plots, will uh, uh, move out their Bermuda grass lawn and replace it with buffalo grass because you, you barely need to mow it, like maybe once a year. Um, and that's pretty incredible. And of course, it's way drought resistant uh, in a climate like this because it's used to a place where it only gets like 10 inches of rain. And then all this stuff coming in, there's some wispy things. That's just some stupid brome. And I just come out here and pull them by hand. Some kind of annual brome. We get rip gut brome out here and other things. And they're kind of like cheat grass where they, they grow up so fast. The same genus, obviously. Uh, and then sort of uh, go to seed and dry out way too early in the summer and change the fire regimes. But let's pull that stuff. Doop. So that's uh, buffalo grass and my favorite tree. Okay, and this time of year, our, you know, our black-eyed Susans haven't bloomed out yet. But man, when they do, this place just turns yellow and brown. Um, but some of the things that are blooming, you can see all this uh, white stuff everywhere. Very common. And this is all yarrow. And uh, I love this plant. Look how beautiful it is even before it grows up. Just, uh, you know, the, the leaves themselves are just gorgeous. Um, and, you know, it doesn't really attract as many pollinating insects as you might think. And maybe that's a phenological thing where it just blooms earlier. but. 
Um, but as, as you look around, you can see I keep all my yarrow. And even in patches where I'm, where I am mowing, I'll mow around the yarrow. Um, we have a lot of this plant, which is outstanding. Tall bone set, or autumn bone set, and here it is, you know, growing in uplands. But this thing really will get six or seven feet tall. And man, by uh, midsummer, when that sucker's blooming, it is uh, pollinator heaven. So I keep all that, obviously. Um, moving over here. Ragweed. You're like, why is this idiot growing ragweed? Well, this idiot does a lot of things that uh, other people don't do. But I do leave my ragweed and I grow patches of ragweed uh, for quail. Um, because every so often there'll be a couple of quail that'll wander through and sort of overwinter here. And, of course, that's one of their preferred foods out here. Uh, and then here's just a little bit. So I don't plant that much formally. Um, but I absolutely do collect milkweed and plant milkweed and let some yarrows grow up and plant milkweed, right? So this is um, about to be the, uh, the, the orange butterfly milkweed and it's just ready to explode uh, in the next week, I'd say. Uh, and then this is gonna be pollinator central. So that's just, you know, digging a trench, not even a trench, I'm just sort of like scraping up the, the ground and dropping some, uh, <clears throat> some milkweed seeds in there that I collected somewhere else. I do a bit of that, collecting stuff, and, and, and here's my garden, mostly growing sunflowers, of course, which is the only important thing to ever need to grow uh, in a world where modern, modern agriculture will feed you, and I can just play around and grow stuff for birds. This is my favorite patch of, uh, <clears throat> of multiple native grasses, and, and not everything you look at right here is native, but, <clears throat> but there's a lot of great stuff in here. There's uh, big blue stem, there's little blue stem, there's Indian grass, there's side oats grama, which I absolutely love. <clears throat> and then there's uh, hairy grama, and those are all different grasses. They're just, every one of them, you know, unique and, and beautiful, if you let them grow. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, um, the other thing you might notice is quite a bit of heterogeneity in my patches that I haven't been mowing. And that is because I really started in the past year burning. So this is one of my, my most recent burn patches. Uh, and Tracy and James have been out helping me burn because they think that's kind of fun. <clears throat> so that's why we got a lot of heterogeneity of, um, you know, like density of grass there. And it's much more barren here. Still, it's kind of early in our growing season because, of course, a lot of our native grasses or all of our native grasses here are, uh, are warm season grasses. So they're just getting going. But there's a couple of neat things in here. This burn patch I thought I'd show you. One is a um, really beautiful plant. Illinois bundle flower. So this is an example of something that I've, you know, gone to some prairie, collected the seeds, and planted them here to try to get them started. And when I say prairie, I mean like uh, a subdivision that was being developed in native grass. And I'm like, oh no, that's going to be horrible. I need to collect some of those seeds. <clears throat> the other thing that's cool is, um, oh, there'll be many cool things. This plant. This is, look how shiny, or just white that is on the underside. This is our native thistle. This is tall thistle. It's got a two-year um, growth period, and so that's, this is this year. Next year, this sucker is going to be like six or seven feet tall, and just basically, basically trees of thistle. And uh, I can attest that the goldfinches and other wildlife really appreciate having those. So I've got a bunch of other thistle here, but all the other thistle is non-native, and I need to pull it before it goes to seed. I might let it bloom, though, just to help the pollinators out a little bit. And then, this is a really neat little plant that's going to be a huge plant. This is another one of those uh, like late summer, fall bloomers. This is um, like splays out and has a like a tree-like shape. And it gets to, again, to be about five or six feet tall. And out here they call it snow in the mountain. Uh, and that's a real characteristic look of uh, central Oklahoma grasslands in late summer and fall. Uh, because those things get really big and they're everywhere and it's pretty cool. Yeah, so you thought I was going to show you some wetlands. We don't have any cool wetlands out here, at least not where I live. Uh, so I, I've had to do more, a lot more upland stuff. Um, but, you know, we have some. And I'll see if I can find some cool stuff to show you later. So long, Brooks's.